2002's My Little Eye tells the story of five strangers, Emma, Danny, Rex, Matt and Charlie, who were selected to participate in a new reality web series where they must live together in a secluded house for six months, and on the condition that none of the contestants leave the show, they will all receive one million dollars. The film picks up on the final days of the show where each contestant has succumbed to cabin fever, misery, boredom and contempt after being deprived of quality supplies, healthy meals and communication with the outside world. As you can imagine, it's taken an immense toll on their physical and mental well-being, with some characters growing impatient, erratic and paranoid after it seems like the show's producers are manipulating the contestants into buckling under the pressure and conceding their life-changing grand prize. While in this day and age most of you will probably get a sense where this is all going, My Little Eye's unique visual style still builds a chilling sense of uncertainty and oppression as you wait for the true horror to inevitably reveal itself. Now, some of you are probably asking, Ryan, why does this film have the quality of a potato? Well, besides the fact it's just really hard to find a copy of this film unless, like me, you own the original DVD or watch it on a few select European countries on Netflix, it's a deliberate deliberate stylistic choice to frame the film entirely through the lens of hidden DV cameras and CCTV that place us purely in the perspective of the viewers watching from home. Taking many notes from The Blair Witch Project, director Mark Evans aimed for absolute authenticity by disregarding most conventional filmmaking logic and encouraging his cast of then and mostly still unknown actors to react instinctually to the script instead of meticulously blocking out each scene, with any dialogue or action that felt too scripted or cliched being removed completely in favour of a naturalistic and sometimes sporadic delivery. I'm not going to say it isn't guilty of still falling into cliché to pad out its relatively short runtime, but while webcam style horrors are more common today along with the found footage subgenre as a whole with the likes of Unfriended, Host, Open Windows, The Den, Spree and everything in between, My Little Eye was actually way ahead of its time by preceding the ubiquitous age of social media, the terminally online, and our taken for granted disregard for privacy. While internet content was already on the go by 2002 or 2001 when the film was shot in Nova Scotia, it was still fairly primitive, and alongside Halloween Resurrection which released the same year and took on a notably similar concept, My Little Eye was also one of the first pieces of media to focus on live streaming before it became what it is today. As such, it can be difficult to realise just how ambitious and experimental the film was in taking a risk with its CCTV format that was arguably 10 years too early to achieve the impact of what it was truly going for. Besides the immense phenomenon of the Blair Witch Project which benefited from brilliant marketing that capitalised on positive word of mouth and early internet sleuthing, found footage was still a substantially uncertain format that most were unfamiliar with. It also didn't help that My Little Eye went through a distribution crisis after Evans and his producer conducted test screenings in the US on 9-11 of all days, leaving them with bad word of mouth and causing their original distributor to beal on the project. Their logo is still in the credits, so I assume everything eventually came together when it released in the US two years after the UK, but despite initial fears that the project would be shelved completely, it was thanks to Momentum Pictures that it received decent attention in the UK after screenings at both the Edinburgh and Toronto Film Festival led to surprisingly rave reactions. It released just a month before 28 Days Later came along and made a bigger splash, and was marketed with a rather alluring obscurity that tied into its themes of surveillance and voyeurism. And what better way to explore a film that later deals with hacking and impossible to break encryption and concerns for privacy than with a sponsor like Surfshark. Surfshark is a virtual private network that with just one simple click masks your IP address and allows you to connect to any country in the world so you can anonymously and safely surf the web without falling prey to other nefarious fish in the sea or being trapped in the fishing net of geographical restriction. For example, if you're using public Wi-Fi in a cafe or hotel and want to better protect your passwords and access sensitive information, Surfshark encrypts your data to keep it confidential and secure. And because they use RAM-only servers, you'll have greater peace of mind knowing that once you disconnect, Surfshark doesn't store that information. However, for us horror fans wanting more value out of 
of our streaming services, by changing to another country, you can unlock an entirely new selection of films and shows previously unavailable to you. For example, I use Shudder here in the UK all the time, but by switching to a Canadian server, I can access films like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Perfect Blue, and One Cut of the Dead that aren't available here on Shudder UK, so I like to think of Surfshark as turning a set menu into an all-you-can-eat buffet. Surfshark gives you one subscription with unlimited devices, so you can share the love with your friends and family without any arbitrary restrictions. And with a 30-day money-back guarantee and 24-7 customer support, there is no better time to try Surfshark VPN today than by using my code Ryan Hollinger for three extra months for free. My Little Eye essentially played off the increasing popularity of Big Brother, a globally franchised reality show that, at the time, was extremely popular in the UK where the film was developed. It was initially conceived as a social experiment to see what would happen if you isolated a diverse group of strangers alone in a house for several weeks and gave the general public almost unfiltered round-the-clock access to their intimate lives. In theory, it was a compelling concept based on George Orwell's dystopian sci-fi 1984 to see how a sample population could be controlled, influenced, and surveilled under totalitarianism. In other words, be careful what you say or do because you're always being watched, judged, and, well, socially executed if you don't gain the public's approval. However, in practice, it was mostly a self-indulgent exploitation of attention-seeking, fame-hungry narcissists, loners, and anyone willing to sacrifice their dignity for fame or a payout. At least, generally speaking, that is, I don't care enough to intellectualize reality television. In the case of My Little Eye, the contestants range from wanting to launch their acting career or pre-influencer media personality, if you will, to seeking challenge in their monotonous life, to conversely escaping their troubled life, to just transparently needing the money, no philosophical or emotional strings attached. It goes right to the extreme of Big Brother's inherent voyeurism, and ponders the what-if behind trusting not only the strangers you're confined to sharing a space with, but the people in charge of that confinement. The contestants only ever acknowledge the production as the company, suggesting they have almost zero knowledge of what's happening behind the scenes, let alone they don't even know where they are as they're dropped in via helicopter with little instruction. As it goes along, you begin to realize that the show purposely selected people with vulnerable or unstable backgrounds, several of which even admit to dropping everything in their life for what, in theory, is technically not all that difficult for a million dollars. The only two rules are that none of them can leave or they all go home empty-handed, and they must abide by a nightly curfew to stay within range of the house. There are no challenges, no games, no surprises. It's simply a test of endurance where the long the boredom and isolation intensifies, the closer some of them come to folding. The best actor and character in the film, Chris Lemsch, who plays the intelligent but volatile loner Rex, perfectly described the story as how one person's reality and paranoia can be transferred so easily to everyone else. It's when they start receiving regular supplies near the end of the show's run, does Rex start to speculate that the producers are trying to bait them out of the game so they don't have to fork up the prize money, and so he believes the group should unify to fight off the mind games being played on them. For example, Danny receives a letter telling him that his grandfather has passed away and his funeral is in Florida, but Rex believes it's possibly a hoax given it's suspiciously the only outside letter they've ever received, and thinks they should support Danny to keep him in the house, even if that requires emotional manipulation as immoral as it is. Later on, they receive a bottle of alcohol and a gun with five bullets in the chamber, which could be interpreted as a sick joke that one of them could go mad and murder the others, and still technically claim the prize since nobody leaves the house, or they could simply use the last bullet on themselves. However, Rex thinks it's a symbolic gesture targeted towards him, because he revealed his abusive, alcoholic father shot himself, thus dismisses it as a provocative psychological tactic, whereby the producers use the sensitive information they learn off the contestants to challenge and test their composure and tenacity. In fact, Mr. I'm in it for the challenge Matt tells Rex he's chosen to play his cards close to his chest so the producers can't get inside his head, to which Rex play 
playfully questions if it's because he has bigger skeletons in his closet that he doesn't want revealed. It isn't written with any complexity to make you think each of them have a reason to turn on each other, but it does keep going back to the notion of how much we can trust people we only know at face value. It's certainly emphasised by the fact that we as the audience are dropped into the film with little context or understanding of the characters up to the point we meet them. Seeing more interaction between them certainly would have helped build better characterization, but the abruptness does add a feeling of ambiguity, disorientation and confusion that fits the weary mindset of the characters. Heck, Rex is probably the only truly functional one six months later, given he just straight up sees through the illusion when he keeps hearing repetitive aisle noises, making him think they're actually on a compound where ambient sound is played on loop. You could say Rex is a bit too much of a conspiracy theorist, but it furthers the tension of them trying to rationalise their strange circumstances, along with theories embedded in your head along the way that one of them could be a killer, or maybe someone sinister is stalking them, or perhaps the place is haunted, or maybe it's all just a red herring and the producers are just continually messing with them. One of the more striking developments comes from when Emma finds a threatening message on her bathroom window that happens to be the same phrase used by a boy called John Riley, who went to the same school as her and later killed his parents. Emma explains that she and Riley used to play a childhood game called Scaredy Cat, where each of them would try to scare each other, and one time Emma seemed to take it too far by pretending to kill his kitten, prompting him to vow vengeance, uttering the phrase Emma finds on the window. Now, firstly, I assume the film was originally called Scaredy Cat because it's odd that they use a different kid's name for the title. My Little Eye makes sense in the context of Big Brother, but this specific scenario leans more heavily on trying to scare the contestants out of the house, which Emma thinks Riley might be involved in, as elaborate as it all sounds. But anyway, the real matter of importance is when Emma later awakens with a bloodied hammer on her bed, which Rex takes the blame for just so that she doesn't leave, suggesting now is the time that the group should definitely heed this as a warning that something seriously messed up is happening and they should probably leave. Yet, before they can do so, a stranger arrives out of the blue, having gotten lost in the forest after after his GPS battery died, and uh, wait, is that Bradley Cooper? Yeah, this was one of Cooper's earliest roles. Obviously, he was yet to become a big movie star, but he was established on shows like Alias that, even at the time, you probably at least had the notion that he was up to something, so spoilers, obviously. His character Travis is a programmer who reveals to have no awareness of the reality show, and after partying with the group that night while his GPS charges, he ends up having intercourse with Charlie while making constant eye contact with the hidden cameras, eventually talking to one, revealing that he made a vile bet to have sex with her. When Rex confronts him the following morning, rightfully accusing him of being a producer, they later find his bloody bag near the forest, assuming he was attacked by someone or something. As more questions continue to arise, Danny is accused of stealing Emma's underwear, which Travis had planted the night before, and with the accusations of perversion, cabin fever, and his grandfather's alleged death, the group find Danny hanged the next morning. With panic and distress at an all-time peak, the group try to contact the producers, but to no avail, to which the reality finally reveals itself when Rex hacks Travis's GPS and uses his credit card to access the website the series is hosted on, and surprise, surprise, it's not only heavily encrypted and hidden from the public, but a subscription costs over $50,000. If you haven't worked it out by this point, don't worry, Rex basically spells it out to us. This might be a snuff film, where viewers bet on who dies, and knowing it's hopeless to venture out into the freezing snow in darkness, they board up the house, take the gun, and prepare for the worst. Now, naturally, this raises more questions and answers, mainly logical holes where you have to suspend your disbelief to accept any answer, such as the assumption that surely at least one of them told their friends or family they were participating in a game show. For this, you could argue it's because it's established they are desperate trouble people, possibly under NDA, after an intense vetting process given how much the perpetrators supposedly know about them. Much of it involves coming to your own conclusions based on loose implications and 
and threads of information littered all the way through. Like, why would they wait six months to murder them? Well, I can't speak for the mind of any psychopath, but I'm just going to go with it being like aging your whiskey in a casket before it's ready to drink. Personally, I didn't mind the reveal because my expectations weren't exceedingly high. I kinda assumed early on it would be a dodgy murder scenario, in fact, it would be more ballsy if the movie was actually just this immoral social experiment. However, there is another twist where it's revealed that Matt's constant desire for challenge led to him being hired to murder the others, starting with Charlie and then Rex, leaving Emma to try and escape only for a fake cop to arrive and incapacitate her. This all happens in very quick but utterly brutal succession, with Matt being shot dead by the impersonating cop soon after to preserve the secrecy between him, his clients, and Cooper's character, who we can assume runs the website given he's a programmer, ending on a super bleak abrupt note as Emma screams in agony and bleeds out in a fridge alone. It's presented with a gritty, nauseating realism that mixes with the grainy aesthetic of the cameras to make it feel like something we should not be watching. But if you've ever indulged in extreme horror cinema before, this might still feel like a basic slasher flick. The funny thing is, I thought about reviewing My Little Eye for a very long time, but it was when I did the rental that I decided to fully commit to it, and going off the comments of that video, it's naturally going to polarize people in the same way, because yes, on the one hand it's underwhelming, but for me, I kinda like how it validated my suspicions. What I will say in its defense is that, for its time, conventional horror films didn't typically end this bleak. It demystifies the final girl trope by straight up literally shooting it down before it even begins, and the whole John Riley fear ends up being a complete red herring. It's unpleasantly and grotesquely unsatisfying, but I think that's the terrifying point of it. It's cruel by the very nature of its villains. That's what I mean when I said director Mark Evans rejected conventional filmmaking logic. In practice, there isn't really a traditional climax. It all just fizzles out once they find out the truth. The game is up, so they have to finish things off swiftly. No names, no exposition for what's happening, because they don't need to explain themselves to their victims. It's just a seemingly anticlimactic finish for their depraved viewers and for themselves, as much as it is for us. I feel like I got more out of this than I set out to show, but hey, you know me, I love my found footage films, especially the obscure ones that not many people know nor remember, so if you have one that's worth checking out, uh, please recommend it to me in the comments below, and until next time, stay safe, stay away from dodgy looking CCTV, and I'll see you all very soon. Bye.